Welcome everybody to AB Live and welcome to to Aeon Byte. My name is Miguel Connor and I am still your pompous of gnosis, that madman across the waters of creation. And there's something about Mary, the woman who knew the all, as the dialogue of the Savior says, the one who had gnosis. And on this show, we can never get enough of the bride of the logos. So uh, today we have uh, we will definitely be concentrating on Mary with an overdue guest, someone who's done incredible research on the history behind the history for ancient Christianity and beyond, and that is Ralph El Ralph Ellis. Ralph, thank you very much for coming on the show. Very good to be with you, Miguel. Um, quite an honor. Thank you. Honor is all ours, yes. And for the audience, we'll be focusing on Ralph's excellent book, Mary Magdalene, Princess of Orange. Good book. Definitely should get it and uh, put it on your uh, shelf with all the other divine feminine and uh, heroines of, Nost of ancient times, as we've done on the show. There are actually quite a few, if you really think about it. And with us, too, we've got the moon dog Vance. Vance, how are you doing on this Freya Day or in Latin countries, Day of Jupiter. Oh, I'm excited about this because Mary Magdalene is one of my favorite characters. Uh, you know, uh, the Mary Magdalene we're about to hear about. So, you know, wise person and it makes up for all the misogyny of the orthodox centuries, right? About putting women down. So women are so intuitive. So it's natural that Mary Magdalene uh, is actually as portrayed as I believe Ralph is going to tell us. Oh, indeed. Agreed 100%. Well, awesome. Well, people are going into the chat room, as always, or definitely moving on. Please super chat your questions for Ralph, and we'll get to them. Or any comments that you have, we will put them on the board. 
Uh, we want to hear your voice because you guys usually, always, not even usually, come up with some excellent questions. And other than that, uh, great shows coming up next week. Uh, in a way, we will continue the theme as next week we'll have a normal podcast, uh, an audio podcast with the amazing John Michael Greer, where he talks about the Cathars, the Holy Grail, the Nassines, and puts it together how these groups were basically smuggling this ancient mystery rites from Eleusinian, the, the mysteries of Eleus the Eleusinian mysteries. And this was actually a tech, not just for spiritual growth, but also for healing the land. And then after that, we should have David Block joining us in a week to do his third in his series about these enigmatic deities, Lucifer, Prometheus, uh, Azazel, and all that. So a lot of good content coming, and I really appreciate those of you who support this podcast. If you find value, help out. We need your help more than ever. So I uh, no, no, can't think of any other uh, housekeeping right now, so let's get to the meat of the matter. Well, Ralph, tell us about uh, how you came interested in writing this book and in Mary Magdalene, or a little bit about your work in general. Yes, well, I've been writing since, uh, well, 40 years, I suppose. Uh, the first chapter I wrote for my Jesus Last of the Pharaohs, I wrote when I was 14. It wasn't published until much later, of course, so I've been interested in these topics for a long, long time. Um, started off with the Old Testament, um, because I saw some similarities with the historical record there. And then I moved on to the New Testament because we have the same problem in the New Testament. All of these characters are missing from the historical record. You know, Jesus, Saul, Mary Magdalene, Mary the, uh, uh, Mary the mother, all missing from the historical record. Now, hmm. reading the New Testament, it seemed to be sort of historical to me. But the problem was nobody can find these people in, in history. And uh, eventually I found this. Well, I suppose I found this, the beginnings of this back in 1997 with my Jesus last of the Pharaohs, where I, I, I sort of looked at the Gospels looking for Saul, St. Paul. And OK, it's a long story. We won't go into it now, but I believe St. Paul is Josephus Flavius. Mm. Now, that changes a, a great deal of things because it makes the gospel story more historical because now we have a historical author. Um, the two lives of these two people match very closely, very closely indeed. The only thing that changes is the date. So we're no longer talking about AD 20s and AD 30 crucifixion. We're now talking about AD 60s and an AD 70 crucifixion because there was a very famous crucifixion in AD 70. Um, and that's all to do with the Jewish revolt. And then, of course, having written all of these books, the, the nature and the, the historicity of Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother came, came up. Now, they're much harder to actually investigate because we, we, we sort of run into mythology very quickly rather than real history. Um, but there was quite a lot of information that could be found. And so I was, tr uh, I, I was looking at this information and trying to trace her history back into France. Um, but the first thing that really, I suppose, came up was, was following on from my other books that these were important people. Okay, we're not talking about a pauper prince of peace. We're not talking about shepherds. Uh, we're talking about very important people. And uh, one of the things that came up, and uh, this is not really my work. This is uh, from the Talmud and, and from Professor Robert Eisenman. Um, and he identified um, Mary Magdalene as being Mary Bothus, Mary and Martha Bothus. And that was very interesting. And he goes into this in some detail with an awful lot of evidence from the Talmud. But that changes everything. And it changes everything so much that when I congratulated um, uh, Professor Eisenman about this, he said, no, 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 I'm not saying that they are the same person. Um, I'm only saying that they base the history and the life of Mary Magdalene upon Mary Bothas. Uh -huh. 
And the reason he says that is that Mary Bothus is an 8060s character. We're back in the 8060s again, as often is the case when you, you start looking at this. Um, but I think he's actually right, although he can't grasp the uh, the end of his research that they are the, one and the same person, because Mary Bothus happens to be the richest woman in the Near East in the first century. So here is a woman who had a dowry when she got married. And of course, Mary uh, Bothus married Jesus. Her husband was Jesus, yeah. Jesus of Gamala, Gamala Sophias, who became the high priest of Jerusalem. Again, like Hebrews 7 says that Jesus was high priest. Um, so Mary Bothus, when she got married, she had a dowry of one million gold denarii. She was the richest woman in the Near East. That's in, in today's money, that's um, approximately $20 billion. Wow. Just but as Ralph, a dowry. Ralph, that, uh, why was she rich? She came from a lawyer, uh, royal line. Uh, I'm sure she wasn't uh, dealing with Bitcoin. <laughs> it had to be <laughs> nobility, right? She came from the nobility. Yeah, she came from the nobility. Now, um, her father in this case um, will be Simon Bothus. Mm. And remember from the Gospels that Mary and Martha lived at the house of Simon? Yeah, that's true. And the father of Mary and Martha Bothus was Simon, Simon Bothus. Uh, you know, this all matches very closely, but of course the Gospels and the priesthood will not admit, of course, to Mary and Martha being the daughters of Simon Bothus because... He was one of the very richest of the aristocrats <clears throat> within um, Judea and Syria. And he was also involved in the Jewish revolt. Um, there were three major aristocrats who controlled the, the wood, uh, the wheat, the food, and uh, the oil. And of course, they were like the oil magnets and the uh, coal and oil magnets today. Um, you can't live without oil. You cannot live without wood. And so they controlled these uh, products and they were immensely wealthy. Um, so Mary Bothus's uh, bedclothes uh, were worth 12,000 gold denarii. That was just a bedclothes, for goodness wow. sake. Um, so, and she married, as I say, she married uh, uh, Jesus, Jesus of Gamala. Uh, Gamala Sophias, and Jesus of Gamala was the leader of 600 rebel fishermen. Now, who was the leader of fishermen in the uh, first century? I think we can guess who that was. And uh, Mary bought the high priesthood for her husband, um, which is pretty much what Hebrews 7 says, because, of course, Jesus became high priest. How did he do so? He was not a Levite. Well, the Talmud says that uh, Mary Bothus bought the high priesthood with a tarkub of silver. And it depends how much you measure a tarkub as being. A tarkub is like a vessel, but it's something like you know, 25 kilos of silver or something. I mean, it's a lot of silver. Might be as high as 75 kilos of silver. And that's how he became high priest. Mm. But of course, after, um, af after the Jewish revolt, so these people were involved in the Jewish revolt, which was AD 66 to AD 70. Um, they lost. They lost that revol revolt. And so we get these um, uh, allusions to Mary losing all of her money after the Jewish revolt. So uh, from the Talmud, it says, uh, Rabbi Yohanan, so Yohanan was the sort of high high priest of uh, Judaism after the Jewish revolt, uh, left Jerusalem riding upon an ass. Well, he's sort of mimicking Jesus there, of course, okay. while his disciples followed him. And he saw a girl picking barley grains from among the dung of Arab cattle. As soon as she saw him, she wrapped herself with her hair. Now, that's indicative of Mary Magdalene, of course, because quite often in, in Renaissance art, she's shown full of hair, of course, covering her body. And we'll go into why that is in a minute. Um, and and uh, she said, Master, uh, she said to him, feed me. My daughter, says Rabbi Yohanan, who are you? 
She replied, I am Mary, the daughter of Bothus Nicodemus. My daughter, he said to her, what has become of the wealth of your father's house? So we can see this highly aristocratic and probably royal family being laid low after the Jewish revolt, losing all of their money and their property. And this is, of course, why that Mary eventually had to go on a, uh, a voyage to Provence in France because they'd lost all of their wealth. Um, royal families and aristocrats play these games, you know, but if you lose, you've got a lot to lose. <laughs> and they lost. Yeah. So they lost the Jewish revolt and they all went into exile. Um, so, yeah, that was one of the first things I found about the Mary Magdalene character that she might have been highly aristocratic um, and, and probably royal. But, I mean, this has been known about. I mean, this is not new. Some people criticize my work and saying, oh, you're, you know, you're, you're running out on a limb with this. You know, nobody else talks about this. But the golden legend, which comes out of the 14th century, says exactly the same. Uh, the golden legend uh, says that, Mary Magdalene had uh, the surname of uh, Magdalo, meaning a castle, and she was born of right noble lineage, and her parents were descended from the lineage of kings. And her father was named Cyrus, and her mother was Eucharis, and uh, her brother was Lazarus, and her sister was Martha, and they possessed castles of Magdalo and Bethany, and also a greater part of Jerusalem. Okay, so this is a family that owns, like, I don't know, 25, 30% of Jerusalem. Yeah. Um, and it goes on to say all of these things they shared among them, so that Mary owned the castle at Magdalene, Lazarus owned the um, part of the city of Jerusalem, and Martha had her part of Bethany. So it's plainly saying, and this is going back into the uh, medieval era, that these people were rich and aristocratic. They knew all about it in that time. Um, and they probably knew about it courtesy of the Crusades and the Knights Templar that had found all of this information right. uh, back in the 12th century. Um, that's why there was such a flowering of this information at that time, because a lot of this information was, um, was not available to people. All we had was what was given to us by the Catholic Church. Um, but of course, when they went to the East, the East had been cut off from Western Christianity by the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Chalcedon, and by the Iron Curtain of Islam. And so the, the Western Church could do nothing about what they were writing about in the East. And so the Eastern Church held different traditions, um, different information, different chronicles. And that's where most of this information came from. Uh, during the medieval era. Um, Wait, Ralph, and, I, if you don't mind me interrupting you, because some might be asking, no, what you're saying makes sense. Royal family, Mary and Jesus, uh, even uh, some, I forget who said, uh, Dr. Carrier wrote, Richard Carrier wrote about this idea of making people poor, whether it's Mohammed or Jesus or Peter is ridiculous. In ancient times, if you wanted to be heard, you had to be educated and have money. You had to, you know, you just didn't get on social media and people would listen to you. So you had to know the Torah. <clears throat> you had to have money. So it makes sense that these figures were educated and had clout. But my question is, this, it makes sense, but how, and then they scatter after the Jewish war, and correct me if I'm wrong, but how does a religion just f fall on top of this chaos, the religion of Christianity as it would be known? Well, Christianity had nothing to do with Jesus, of course. Um, Jesus was a Nazarene Jew um, who would not let one jot or tittle of the uh, Judaic law uh, be changed. Um, Christianity came from St. Paul, uh, who I always call Saul because that's his proper name. So Saul was the instigator of this because Saul um, had been on an evangelical tour uh, with Barnabas and they'd gone round and been beaten and stoned and whatever. And he came back and at the Council of, um, uh, Council of Jerusalem, uh, he said to James, the brother of Jesus, look, um, can I preach 
to the Gentiles because he got a lot of interest from the Gentiles about this Nazarene style of Judaism, which I call Egypto-Judaism because it's, it's not really anything to do with modern Judaism. Um, and James said, yeah, for some strange reason. And he said, yeah, okay, these are the four tenets of simple Judaism. Um, don't eat animals uh, that have been sacrificed to idols. Don't uh, eat animals that have been strangled. Don't drink blood and don't indulge in fornication. And that was it. The whole of Mosaic law went out of the window. You've got four simple rules of simple Judaism. And that is what Saul was teaching on his second tour uh, of, of the Mediterranean. And he became the apostle to the Gentiles, as he says himself. Now, because he had a much larger, larger audience, he gained a lot more followers. You know, the Nazarene church of Jesus and James was only preaching to the Jews, whereas Saul could uh, preach to the whole of the Roman Empire. Okay. And so he became more and more powerful, more and more rich as he got more and more followers. And his church actually became um, larger and stronger and more powerful than the church of Jesus and James. And of course, because of the Jewish revolt and their in involvement in that, um, the Nazarene church was um, was was uh, persecuted by the Romans because they started a revolt against Rome, whereas the church of Saul was pro-Roman. Pay your Roman taxes, turn the other cheek. It was brilliant. You know, it's exactly what Rome wanted. Obey your Roman masters because they are servants of God. This was just perfect. So Rome promoted the simple Judaism uh, of Saul and persecuted. So the, the only persecution that was going on uh, was against the Nazarene church of Jesus and James. Mm. Um, and so it was from the simple Judaism of um, of Saul that we get Christianity. No, that makes sense. Not and from the Church of Jesus and James. Right. And so you said uh, uh, two questions or one double question. Uh, Egypto-Judaism, what's the connection of Mary and Jesus to Egypt? And with Paul or Saul, we're talking mystery religion in Tarsus. Is that what he adopted? Mithras and all those, all that kind of vibe and brought it into Judaism? Yes. Um, well, there are many connections, of course. I mean, if we go into great detail, um, my Jesus King of Edessa book actually says that he was related to the Egyptian royal line, but we won't go into that. Uh, just from the Gospels, Jesus went to Egypt for his education. Right. Um, you know, he was there for his youth. That's when you are educated. Uh, and of course, they make it out that he fled there, of course. But if he was a prince, and I'm, I'm saying that Jesus was a real king, he's called a king on 36 occasions. He was the king of the Jews. Uh, if he was a real king, so a real prince at that time, of course, he would go to Egypt because that's where you would go for your, your education. The greatest university um, of Rome was in Alexandria. Right. That's where you'd go for your education. Uh, that's why it says in the Gospels, out of Egypt, I have called my son. Uh, that's why he was known in the works of Josephus and in the Gospels themselves as the Egyptian false prophet. Now, I've, I've had backlash from some critics who are saying, oh, Ellis says that Jesus was the Egyptian false prophet. Well, of course he was. It was the Egyptian false prophet who took the 5,000 out into the wilderness. Now, who did mm -hmm. that? Uh, it was the Egyptian false prophet who took uh, the band of followers and apostles out onto the Mount of Olives for a midnight meeting that was interrupted by the um, Roman guard. Now, mm. who did that? Okay, that was Jesus. So we can be pretty sure that the Egyptian false prophet was a mention of Jesus by obviously his enemies who didn't like him. So they called him the Egyptian false prophet because he was something to do with Egypt. And I say he was related to the um, uh, Egyptian royal line, but we won't go into that today. Um, and he was educated in Egypt, so he would have had he would have had the um, the secret knowledge, the sacred knowledge that comes out of Egypt. This is why the Talmud says that Jesus came out of Egypt with the sacred name of of God tattooed upon his thigh. Okay, they don't 
teach that much in Christianity, but that's what the Talmud says, because again, it's saying that he came out with secret knowledge from uh, Egypt. Um, and um, yeah, he came out with some, I mean, some of it we, we have, we have the, um, uh, the water to wine miracle now given as a miracle, of course, in the gospels, but this was a well-known trick within Egypt. It was created by a uh, hero of Alexandria or Heron of Alexandria, who was the uh, Mechanicos, they called him, the um, Leonardo da Vinci of the first century who made all of these wonderful machines, you know, including steam turbines and water pumps for a fire engine and God knows what, singing birds, all these sort of things. But one of his um, most famous tricks and, and one of the tricks that he liked to do uh, the most, he made four different examples was making trick jugs that turn water into wine. Now, these are well known if you study history. And yet, of course, they're never going to preach this from the pulpit. They say it's a miracle. No, it was a trick jug by Heron of Alexandria. You have a, a standard um, pewter sort of jug, jug um, and it has two compartments in it. And you have a thumb hole in the handle. And depending on whether you cover the hole or open the hole, you either pour from one compartment or the other compartment. So you can pour wine or water, depending on what you want. <laughs> That's great. Now, it was highly technical. It depended on water surface tension and suction and hydraulics and all this sort of stuff, uh, siphonic action. So it was a very complicated little device. But it was made to... Um, to amaze the aristocracy and to amaze the, the people if it was done by the priesthood. But it was mainly an aristocratic thing. You can imagine these were supremely expensive, these, these right. toys. Um, and you, you use them at your wedding to amaze your guests, which is exactly what he did at the wedding at King. <laughs> um, and <of> course... <laughs> Fits so well. <laughs> And of course, that trick came out of Egypt. I mean, this is why, you know, we sort of know he was a prince of Egypt. This is where he got all of this uh, information and technology from. But Ralph, people are talking about, what about Mary? Would she also would have gone to Egypt for different teachings or? Well, she was known as Mary of Egypt. So yes, I'm I, I, uh, very much, um, yeah, I, I think she was. Now I want to perhaps drop another, um, bombshell, I suppose. Uh, Mary was probably Jesus's sister mm. because that was the common thing to have a sibling marriage. Oh. Uh, King Agrippa II did when he married, as it were, um, Berenike, who was his sister. Uh, Queen Helena, who is central to this Edessan story that I'm, uh, I often talk about. She was married to her brother. Um, and we also have from uh, Saul, Saul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 5, he says, uh, and it, um, who's he talking to? I forget who he's talking to. But anyway, he says, have we not the power to lead about a sister wife as well as the other apostles do? And as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas, uh, Cephas is Peter, do. So Saul is asking for a sister wife because the other apostles all have sister wives. Um, now, you, if you read this in many Bibles, especially if you get the American Standard, which is a rotten Bible, um, it'll say something like a sister and a wife right. because they want to cover it up. But that's not what it uh, actually says. Uh, it's in Adelphi Gurney, I think, if I remember correctly in the Greek. Um, if you want to find out what it really says, you need a Bible like the... Um, uh, oh, gosh, which is it? I've forgotten for a minute. I'll, I'll remember in a minute. Um, no there are two um, literal Bibles. They call them a, the Derby is one of them, the Derby Bible, which is a literal Bible, which has a direct translation from the Greek. Uh, you will find that many Bibles, they actually try and interpret what the Greek is actually saying. And because they don't understand the underlying information that they're trying to interpret, they often interpret wrongly, like saying a sister and a wife or a, a sacred wife or something like that. They translate it very badly. But if you look at the Derby 
and the Rotherham is the other one, the Rotherham Bible, they will say a sister wife um, because that's what the royalty used to do. They used to keep it in, in the family, just like all of the pharaohs of Egypt kept yeah. it in the family, just like Cleopatra of Egypt. She married both of her brothers. Um, this was standard within the royal family. <clears throat> and again, it rather shows that these people were royal if they were keeping it in the family and having a sister wife. No, that, yeah, that definitely makes any sense. What do you think, Vance? Question from you or a comment? Uh, yeah, one question I had is uh, when you mentioned one of the laws that Saul uh, put forth was uh, against fornication, was that all relations with women or just outside of a marriage? No, what, what they tend to mean by fornication is this problem of the um, sister wife and things of that nature. Um, this was okay for the aristocracy but they didn't want the laity all doing this as well. There was a Saul in the epistles complains about people sleeping with their mothers and things of this nature. So they were trying to prevent that amongst the laity, but within I the see. royalty, of course, it was de rigueur. That's what they uh, always did within the royalty because they had to keep the bloodline pure in their terms. And that's what they did. Um, so yeah, that's what that tends to mean. I wonder what they thought about their bloodlines and where they originated, you know, the, from the Nephilim, from the Old Testament, or, you know, some, some sort of beyond human source or, the, you know, that connected to God um, or what? They, I don't know if they take it back that far, but I think the Nazarene, the Nazarene we have from um, some of these um, contrarian uh, commentators, they say of the Nazarene that they uh, venerated the primeval Adam. And the primeval Adam was a uh, hermaphrodite. Uh, might have been androgynous, but anyway, um, I think they say hermaphrodite. Um, so uh, a non-male, a non-female ancestor. Um, I get the feeling that when they're talking about that, because we don't know who this primeval Adam was, um, I think they're talking about Pharaoh Akhenaten, Oh. because if you look at Pharaoh Akhenaten, he is androgynous. He has no genitalia. He has sort of wide hips of a woman, a small bust and a very st strange shaped body, etc. I think they're talking about Akhenaten because Akhenaten was the first of the monotheists. Uh, he was something to do with this royal line because the god of uh, Israel is called the Arden and the god of Akhenaten was called the Aten or the Ardon. So the the is the Israelite god name is the same god name as Akhenaten was using. So we can be sure that they knew about Akhenaten. There was something to do with Akhenaten. I mean, uh, Psalms, Psalm 104, I think it is, is a copy of the hymn to the Aten, written by Akhenaten himself. That's in the Bible. Um, so we know that it's connected with this. And uh, I go through this as being one of the Exodus events is connected with the Exodus of Akhenaten. Um, and I say a lot more about this as well. But uh, yeah, if if we're looking at the primeval, primeval Adam that they used to venerate, uh, then I think we're going back as far as into Egypt. We're talking about Pharaoh Akhenaten and Nefertiti. Uh, the two naked lovebirds in the garden of the Arten. Um, that's where a lot of it comes from. Uh, um, you're singing my tomb because I've always thought there was a connection between Akhenaten and, you know, the Hebrews afterwards. Yeah. Migration. Well, their, you know, their and... exodus is the same. Um, yeah. We have this from Manifo. I don't want to go off topic too much, but the exodus is uh, of the Hyksos and the exodus is um, of Akhenaten. There were two exodus events. Um, are the same. And of course, you know, the the brother of Akhenaten was called Moses. So you get the two brothers, you get uh, Aaron and Moses and Akhenaten and his brother was called Moses. <laughs> um, so uh, the history fits very well. Amazing. Um, and explains quite a lot. Thanks. That's great. Yeah, Freud got it. Freud got it. Well, he was a little yeah, off. Yeah, Freud got, got it first. It. Yeah, he wrote <laughs> yeah, he was Moses and Monotheism. Uh, so, yeah, this information has been out there for a long, long time. And, uh, you know, people still criticize me for it. But this uh, information has been 
gestating, you might say, because I don't think Freud got all of the information, but he certainly got the foundations of yeah, it yeah. Uh, and set people on the right path. That's for sure. Yeah, I think we have a super chat, right, Vance? We do. Let me put it up there, and yeah, let me thank you, Brett, for the support. And the question is, yeah, love the program. As always, I look forward to every interview. You're headed for a thousand subs. I doubt it. I am being I am being suppressed by the algorithms, but we will keep fighting. My burning question is for you, Ralph. Did Mary go by any other names? Uh yes, she did. Um, I'm just trying to think about this because I, um, you know, I don't read this book very often. I read it to, uh, yesterday and today, and I'm yeah. thinking, oh, that's good. Who wrote this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you didn't do um, too bad of a job. So <laughs> I'm, I'm going to yeah. give him a good Amazon review <laughs> when I go there. I've not read it for 10 years, and I'm <laughs> thinking, oh, there's a lot of good information here that I've forgotten about <laughs> completely. Um, but yes. Miriam, um, Mariamne, I, something, a related name maybe? Uh, well, she had many, uh, a lot of these people had titles. So she was known as the Mari star, um, uh, Stella Maris and things of that nature, the sea star. Um, so by being the sea star, she was actually the, uh, an incarnation of Isis, Aphrodite. Um, she was the, um, the queen of heaven. But these were titles that were thrown down the ages, and so that um, uh, her mother would have been, her, her grandmother would have been called Orania, in, in my view, this family that came out of Egypt and out of uh, Persia. Uh, the, the family name was Orania, meaning the heavens. So she was the queen of heaven, the queen of the stars, the queen of Sheba. The queen of Sheba means the queen of the stars in Egyptian. Um, and these were the titles that these people had. And um, that's why, uh, perhaps if I can show some images, that's why we get these share screen. We get these. You want to do it or I can do it? Yeah, I was just going to do it here, if you don't mind. Uh, of course, of course. But I've got to move it into the same screen otherwise it won't pick it up so right. let me just quickly do this uh i had it on the wrong page okay so now if we do that again so share screen share screen share a window share that one and okay that should be coming up Bingo. all right you're in uh, so yeah, like that's my Mary Magdalene book. Um, the next photo is just showing that um, she's always dressed as a queen, of course, because she really was royal, and she's dressed in gold, which is important. Uh, we'll come on to that in just a few seconds. Um, and she is the queen of the stars, and of course, she is the queen of the stars because she is the queen of Sheba. The queen is the queen. Queen of Sheba is the queen of heaven. Sheba in Egyptian means star. So she's the queen of the stars. And note, there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve stars. Hmm. Mm. We'll, we'll see why that is in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here she is again. This is Magdalene because she's in gold. Uh, this is why you can swap between the two Marys because these titles went down through history. Um, so the uniform of these ladies is if you see green and gold or green and orange, that's Mary Magdalene. So in this case, they've got the Magdalene um, with the uh, stars around her head and the moon in blue. Um, so uh, that comes from... Let me just quickly look that up. Uh, Revelations 12.1, I forgot what the verse was. The verse uh, says, um, there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and right. the moon under her feet and upon her head was a crown of 12 stars. So that's what they're indicating here. It comes from the book of Revelations. And uh, who was the 
goddess who had stars around her head and was identified with the moon. Um, that was Isis, of course, who yeah. is Astarte, who is uh, Aphrodite, who is Venus. So this is um, Mary, in this case Magdalene, being um, being pictured as Aphrodite. Um, but then we go, the more common imagery is this one. This is a very Catholic romantic. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is Mary the mother because she's in blue and white. And uh, that's the uniform difference between the two of them. Um, again, with the 12 stars and she's yeah. standing on the moon. And, and you'll see this in a lot of cathedrals. This too. comes from Ljubljana. This is way down, you know, um, in the former Yugoslavia. And again, she's standing on the moon. This is Mary the Mary the mother um, as Isis, as Aphrodite. Um, and of course, in Greek terms, she is Orania. And this is the Greek Orania, who again is the queen of heaven, as it were. She is a muse, the muse of heaven. And you can see the stars uh, above her head. And she's in the blue and white because she's in the blue and white of the... Uh, a summer's day of blue with white clouds. She is the queen of heaven. Um, and so I was going to show another one um, before going to that. Somewhere here we have a zodiac. Uh, I don't know if people know that the primary symbol of Nazarene Judaism was the zodiac because that's not taught very much. I didn't find out about this immediately. It took a long time before I found out about this. But all over uh, Judea, they are these ancient zodiacs. Um, and they're, they're in synagogues. They're, they're Judaic. These are Nazarene Judaic. This one's on the Sea of Galilee. This is the Hamat Tevera syna um, synagogue. And you can see it's a standard zodiac in a synagogue with Helios in the, in the center. And Helios is holding a blue-green spherical Earth in his gravitational grasp. So they understood the um, heliocentric model of the solar system. This was the level of Egyptian knowledge that they held wow. within wow. these families. And strangely enough, this, um, this zodiac was owned by Jesus. Jesus of Gamala Sophias, the same guy that we were right. just been talking about, who was married to Mary Bothas. He owned this one. We, we have that from uh, Josephus Flavius tells us so, because Josephus Flavius, the Jewish historian, was sent to uh, Tiberius on the Sea of Galilee to destroy this zodiac because it had heretical images of animals on it. You can see how difficult, difficult, yeah. <laughs> how different Nazarene Judaism was from standard classical Judaism because the Judaism, uh, Judaic authorities in Jerusalem wanted this um, zodiac destroyed. And that's wow. why Josephus went there to destroy it. But before they got there, um, they burnt the palace down so Josephus would never find it. Um, and, yeah, for the uh, audience, uh, real quick, talking about Nazarene Judaism, if you guys get a chance, Tobias Churton in his book on John the Baptist makes a really good case that the Nazarene Judaism was actually sort of an order, events was talking about bloodlines, looking for Nephilim and other evil, making sure this stuff stayed away from humanity. So I think this is all tying in because, of course, they would have to know magic and astrology. Yeah, and, and they were different, of course, because they wore their hair long. They they were from the Nazarites, right. uh, from the Old Testament. So it's a very old um, form of Judaism. And uh, they didn't grow their hair. Sorry, they didn't cut their hair. So they had long hair and beards, just like the Edessan royal family had long hair and, and beards. Mm. Um, and they were the separated ones. They They... The Nazarene means to separate, and by separate, I think what they mean is like the um, group at, down at Qumran, the Essenes, a group of people who separate off into sort of like a convent or a, um, a monastery, and they separate themselves off from the world, you know, to dedicate themselves to God and think, you know, a bit like John the Baptist sort of thing, you know. No, of course. Um, and so I. Th that is basically what the Nazarene were. And 
the the matriarch um, of this family, no, the one down from the matriarch, Queen Helena, she became a Nazarene Jew. Uh, we have this from uh, the Talmud tells us so. So yeah, the, this this family were Nazarene Jews. Um, but going back to the Mary figure, so we have this Mary figure who's identified with the moon, of course, and we get that in early Christian monasteries. So here's a monastery. This is from, again, the Sea of Galilee. This is the Betshian zodiac mm -hmm. in a Christian monastery. This is about 6th century. Um, uh, again, on the Sea of Galilee. Um, and what they've done, we've just seen the zodiac they had, again, on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, this one, they've changed it slightly so that it's it's calendrical. So I don't know if you can read it around the edges here. All of these men are named after months. So on the left here, we've got Aprilos, Maos, Unios, and then on the right, we've got Octoberos. So it's, it's the months of the year. But of course, the months of the year and the um, signs of the zodiac go round together in the night sky. So the one is commensurate with the other. Um, but note in the center, we have a man and a woman dressed as the sun and the moon. Now, who is the moon? Well, we've already seen who the moon is. That's Mary, the mother, or Mary Magdalene. Um, with 12 stars round her head. Why 12 stars? Well, because there are 12 signs of the zodiac um, around the royal couple who sit at the center of the zodiac. In this case, a calendrical zodiac in a monastery um, on the Sea of Galilee. So that is the basis of their religion. You can see how different this religion is to standard classical Judaism that we know today. It was quite different. And of course, if you remember that um, 12 stars around her head with the blue cloak, where did that go to? Uh, well, it went to the EU, of course. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, the EU flag was based upon, and the, the guy who designed it um, actually admitted this, that he based it upon the 12 stars that circle the head of Mary, the um, mother. Um, so the EU is actually based on the tenets of, well, the sort of astrological and astronomical tenets of Christianity. It's one and the same. For a while, they, they, they tried to make out that uh, there were 12 nations within the EU. Um, but then, of course, the number of nations in the EU got bigger and bigger and bigger, <laughs> and the flag yeah. remained the same. So, yeah, this <clears> is <throat> 12 gold stars on a blue background is the flag of the EU. Um, so, yeah, that's a sort of interesting introduction to Mary and her imagery. Um, I don't know, should we continue with um, Mary and the skull? Yeah, let's hear it. The, yeah, the more Why symbolism not? we can... Here? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, here's Mary, and uh, as I said, they have a uniform. So Mary, the mother, is blue and white, um, whereas Mary Magdalene is green and gold or green and orange. So this is the Magdalene. She's in gold. And you'll see she has red hair. She always has ginger hair. And she always has either a, a jar, a stone jar, an alabaster jar, or a skull. And in this case, you can see a skull in her left hand. Uh, and this is ubiquitous for Mary. Here's another one with the skull in her right hand. Uh, what color is her? Oh, she's got a red dress, but blue as a cloak. That's not standard. Again, she's got a skull there. This is a more modern one from the 19th century holding a skull. Um, this is going back in time a bit. Uh, holding a skull. I think we've seen that one already, haven't we? I'm not sure. Mm, yeah. here's, here's another one. So you get the idea. Mary holding a skull. And it gives an idea of the symbolism, of, the, of which is what we find in these 
um, ancient imagery. Uh, most of this is um, from the medieval type era uh, or Renaissance era. Uh, there is symbology and you've got to try and understand what the symbology is. And um, the symbology of the skull, um, well, we have a couple of options here. Um, she wasn't auditioning for Macbeth. We can put that off the table. <laughs> no, it certainly wasn't Macbeth, no. No, sorry. Um, I'm <laughs> getting the wrong. I'm <laughs> even getting the wrong Shakespeare. Hamlet. She wasn't auditioning for Hamlet. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was Hamlet, wasn't it? It was in yeah. Denmark, yes. Um, so Mary with a skull. Well, if, if you read um, uh, something in, in an art gallery, they'll say it's the penitent Mary. Uh, she's contemplating her mortality, and that's why she's holding a skull. Um, but I, I don't believe it's that at all. It's because uh, in Latin, a skull is a calvaria, calvary. Um, in Hebrew, it's Golgotha. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, Jesus was actually crucified at Golgotha or Calvary which is the place of the skull. So quite simply, this is just Mary uh, Magdalene indicating where her loved one was, um, mm. was crucified at the place of the skull. And that's why she's holding a skull. But just to add to that a little bit, in, in France in, in later centuries, uh, Fallion, who was one of the French... Um, poets and so on he wrote um, about the city of orange and so on that we're going to talk about maybe later um, he said it was a pot and tet a, a a vessel of the head well because it's a skull it's a vessel of the head but of course in french a potentate is a potentate a queen so he's making this wonderful play on words that Mary Magdalene was a queen, a potentate. Um, and so you see this word play all over the place um, within uh, medieval and Renaissance uh, artwork. Um, the other one we get, of course, is that Mary, again, with her flame red hair, uh, is always holding a vessel. Now, this one, she seems to be holding a grail, which is not standard. It's normally something like this, where she's holding a unguent jar. She is the, uh, the woman with the alabaster jar, and you can see the alabaster jar on the left there. Um, and again, Mary Magdalene, she's in gold as usual. Um, she is the lady with the alabaster jar because she was the... Um, uh, lady um, who anointed Jesus with spikenard, right. with oil. Um, and, and again, we get uh, different interpretations of this, but I think there's only one interpretation you can have. Um, from Matthew, uh, when was that? Matthew 26, 6, I think it is. It says, when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon, so again, they're at a house of Simon, which is Simon Bothus, the richest man in the Near East, but they won't tell you that. Um, there came a, a woman having an alabaster box of precious ointment and poured it on his head as they sat to eat. So here is the anointing of Jesus by a woman. Again, they're always covering up things. They're, they're never honest. Um, and you have to go down to... Um, well, they're at the house of Simon, and the house of Simon is the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, of course. Um, and which one tells you the best? I think it was... Um, Well, the golden legend, I'm just trying to uh, see which one uh, says it the most clearly, but the golden legend, which is again from the medieval era, uh, says, uh, this Mary Magdalene, is she that washed the feet of our Lord and dried them with her hair 
and anointed them with precious ointment and did a solemn penance at the time of grace um, and was the first that chose that best part which was at the feet of the Lord and heard his preaching. Um, if you read all of the three examples of this anointing, so we've got John 12, 1, and we've got Luke 7, 36, it's pretty clear that the Mary, Mary and Martha from the house of Simon, was Mary Magdalene, just as it says in the Golden Legend. And if you read all of those three together, it's pretty uh, obvious that it was Mary Magdalene. So she anointed Jesus with oil. And not very much is made of that. But I think this is um, very important because to become the Christ or to become the Messiah, you have to be anointed with oil. The Christ or the Messiah means the anointed one, the anointed priest king. Um, let me just... Um, maybe stop sharing there we go so we're back again so um the the christ is the anointed priest king so is the messiah and it, it, it is not really a uh, a spiritual or a sacred name it can apply to you know a secular king so king david was the messiah so was cyrus the great he was called the messiah because he let the Jews go out of Persia. Um, so it's a secular king. When they are anointed, they are known as the Christ or the Messiah. And that's exactly the same ceremony that Queen Elizabeth II went through uh, when she was anointed back in the 1950s. She was anointed uh, with oil by the high priest, who is the Archbishop of Canterbury. Now, that's what's going on in this little ceremony. Um, Jesus is being anointed with oil. So he's being anointed. He was a prince and now he's being anointed uh, with oil to become the king. And the person who does it is Mary Magdalene. So effectively, that is saying that Mary Magdalene was the high priestess because only the high priestess would do something quite so important as anointing the next king of Judea. Um, so he became the king of the Jews. And if uh, we go back to my Odessa theory, I, I apologize to listeners and readers um, that they don't know much about Odessa at present, but the queen of Judea at this time was Queen Helena of Odessa, Odessa Adiabene. Mm -hmm. So this royal family were the royal family of Judea at this very time in the AD 50s. Uh, Queen Helena owned the largest tomb and the largest palace in Jerusalem. It's just at the foot of the Temple Mount. They're just un uncovering it now, doing some archaeology on that, that uh, very palace. And it was Queen Helena of Edessa who bought the solid gold menorah for the temple. Temple of Jerusalem. So you can see how closely linked this royal family was with uh, Judea and Judean politics. And remember that Queen Helena was a Nazarene Jew. She had converted to Judaism. And so her son, if she was the queen of the Jews, effectively, um, then her son would become the king of the Jews. And I think that's exactly what was happening in this small ceremony. Um, the reason it was happening in a house was because uh, they'd probably been caught out. The king had died. And, you know, in, in these ancient cultures, you've got to, st <laughs> you've got to stamp your, you've got to make your mark very quickly. Otherwise <laughs> someone else is going to take it from you. Yeah. And so you've got to have a coronation pretty damn quick in order to um, ensure the succession will come down to you. And I think that's what they're doing here. They had a um, uh, they had a ceremony at the house of Simon instead of in the temple. And remember, they weren't fully Orthodox Jews, so it was probably very difficult at them, for them at that stage to actually enter the temple. Um, that didn't happen until Jesus become high priest. 
and in my chronology, which is a, a later cr chronology, 40 years later, that didn't happen until AD 62-ish, something of that nature. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that's Very a good introduction to the, the wealth and the royal family of Mary Magdalene, how that these were important people. Good argument. Yeah, I'm I'm with you. It makes sense. And again, going against Robert Eisenman is I would never bet against him because his book, <laughs> uh, James the Brother of the Lord, is just such a well researched. It's a wonderful tag. book. Yeah. It's um, so but where he got there, all but the last hurdle, because he would not say that um, Mary Magdalene was Mary Bothus because they are in the wrong era. They are 40 years displaced. Right. And he couldn't overcome that hurdle. So he had to say the history of one was based upon uh, the life of the other. Right. Um, but if you understand that this was an AD 60s story, not an AD 20s story, then it all matches. And we can go into this chronological chasm later, but that's... Um, that's a whole talk in itself. <laughs> right. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. And as I tell the audience, yeah, get the book for more. So shall we travel to France? Unless there's a riot yes. in Paris. <laughs> yes. So we, we dash off to France. Well, we've la, seen la. the reason why, because they lost all of their money. They lost yeah, the, the Jewish war. revolt. Again, this is all about the Jewish revolt era. Um, and the house of Simon Bothus lost all their money. They they bet everything on red, and it came up black. So they really um, thought they were going to take over the Romans. I don't, yeah, they really thought well, that. Perhaps <laughs> we we could go through this very quickly because sure, this sure. is um, we have a lot of these prompts within the uh, gospel story uh, as to what this story was talking about, and one of them uh, is the parable of the vineyard owner, um, and it says uh, and. This is a parable by Jesus. And uh, he says there was a Lord who planted a vineyard and let it out to a tenant and went to a far country. And when the harvest drew near, he sent his servants to the tenant so he would receive his rent. But the tenant took his servants and they beat one and killed another and stoned another. So when the Lord, the absentee landlord, goes to the vineyard, um, what shall he do to those tenants? he will miserably destroy those wicked men and let out his vineyard to another tenant who will pay their rent on time. And you've got to think, hold on, what's that got to do with the man of the people, Jesus? Right. He is uh, promoting the rights of absentee landlords to kill their tenants if they don't pay their rent. <clears throat> what does that have to do with the Christian ethic? Um well, it doesn't make any sense, of course, uh, until you realize that this was talking about Rome. This was talking about uh, the Jewish revolt. And of course, the Romans were in Judea. But these monarchs up in Edessa, remember that uh, Queen Helena was the queen of Judea. They thought they owned these lands. And so to understand this parable, all you need to do is change uh, the absentee landlord with the Edessan king and the tenant with the Romans. And then you read it again and it says, there was an Edessan king who had lands in Judea. Yes, they did. They thought they were the um, kings uh, and queens of Judea. And they let it out to the Romans because the Romans were on these lands. Of course, we know they were. And they went to a far country. They went back to Edessa, which is in northern Syria. And when the harvest drew near, he sent his servants to the Romans that he might receive his rent. But the Romans took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. So when the Edessan king of these lands comes, what will he do to these Romans? He will miserably destroy these wicked Romans and let out his lands to another tenant who will pay their rent on time. And that's what the Jewish revolt was all about. It was a tax revolt against okay. Rome because they thought they owned these lands and they should receive rent, tribute. But the Romans were on these lands and the Romans were asking for tribute from the Edessans. <laughs> uh, this is a tenant asking for rent from the landlord. <laughs> um, and and, good trick. <laughs> it's great if you can do it, but, you know... <laughs> 
And of course, um, so they started this Jewish revolt and they lost. Uh, and that's how they lost all of their money. So they bet everything on this revolt against Rome and they lost. And so they had to go into exile. Um, so we'll like, come on like to this Imelda later. The Jesus Marcos, like Sorry, Imelda Marcos. Had to, yeah. She had <laughs> yes. to grab all her shoes and go to France. Huh? It, it happens all the time, doesn't yeah. it? You know, yeah. people... Sh all the time. Th these rich and wealthy people, they, they bet everything sometimes, and sometimes they lose. And, get on a helicopter yeah. and get out of Dodge. In this case, it was <laughs> sandals, down, not yeah. shoes, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and on a boat without any stat, what, she just floated with the sails or something, the legend goes. Just yeah, by itself. like the um, Prime Minister of Afghanistan, I will stand <laughs> with my people. And until I see the helicopter leaving, and then I'll jump on the helicopter. Yeah, I'm out of here. <laughs> A bag full of million dollars. <laughs> yes. Oh, I did. Um, so, yeah. Uh, what, are, what are they safe? Um, life, history doesn't repeat. It, it just mimics itself or something. What's the saying? It rhymes. It rhymes. it rhymes. Yes, of course. It just rhymes. And it does. Uh, Mark Twain. Um, so they get sent on this exile. Um, now, the Jesus character, we'll go into this later, he gets um, taken to Rome in, in chains. Uh, but uh, the women are obviously allowed to go uh, off on their own, and they go to um, Provence in the south of France, which is a, a common place where th these people were sent. Uh, if I remember correctly, uh, Pontius Pilate was sent there when he disgraced himself by being too much of a tyrant. And so was uh, Herod uh, Archelaus. I think he was sent to the south of France. So it was a common place. They would send people within the Roman Empire, but far enough away um, from Judea that they couldn't be a problem back in Judea. Right. Um, and we get this from the Golden Legend, which says uh, there was a time with the apostles, St. Maximin, uh, one of the 72 disciples of our Lord. Remember, Jesus had 12 disciples. Then he had another 72. Um, to whom the Blessed Mary Magdalene was committed by St. Peter. When the disciples were departed, St. Maximin, Mary Magdalene, and Lazarus, her brother, and Martha, her sister. Again, here we see that Mary Magdalene was the sister of Lazarus and the sister of Martha at the house of Simon. Again, the um, golden legend is saying that, you know, this was Mary Magdalene. Um, all of these together and many others were put in a ship without tackle or rudder um, in order to be drowned. But by the purveyance of the almighty God, they came to Marseille, uh, where as none would receive them to be lodged, they dwelt and abode under a porch in front of a temple. Mm. So... We're now delving into mythology more than history because we really don't have the history. But this is the mythology that they went to the south of France. Mary Magdalene, um, Martha, her sister from the house of Simon, and Lazarus, who was the guy who was raised from the dead by Jesus. And they're all off on this boat without a, some of them say without a mast. Um, and what they're basically saying there is, is, without the husband, without Jesus. The, the ship is female, of course, but the mast is male. So we have a ship without a mast. Um, so we have a, a princess without a prince. Uh, and off they go to Provence. Um, and they end up um, at Saint-Marie-de-la-Mar on the south of France which is where it's celebrated even to this day. They have this celebration of them coming ashore. <clears throat> and all of the gypsies of the area come down to St. Mary de la Mar, and they have this big celebration of Mary Magdalene coming ashore, Mary Magdalene and, and her daughter, um, who I forget what her name was for a minute, but anyway. Was it Sarah? Was it Sarah? Yeah, Sarah. Uh, Sarah, Sarah Karma. Sarah the Black, Sarah Cam, meaning black from the Egyptian, right. which is a good illustration because you get a lot of these, um, especially down in Provence, you get a lot of these um, uh, Black Marys. Um, and 
That again is symbolic. People don't often understand what it means, but it means cam, which is the Egyptian for uh, black. But it was also the name of Egypt itself. So by painting a statue black and having a black Mary, uh, you, you're just meaning Mary of Egypt, just like Saint Mary of Egypt. There was a uh, a saint called Mary of Egypt for the same reason. So this blackness is is a reference to Egypt that she came from Egypt. Um, Saint Marie, it's a lovely place. If if you get a chance to go down there, I've been down there. Uh, Okay. half a dozen times and it's very nice lovely little seaside town very um uh well known in france as a sort of holiday destination and then very nice beaches and so on great restaurants all the rest of it so yeah a lovely place um and it's exactly where you would end up and it's a good place where you can beach a boat for a start it's got this lovely shelving uh sandy beach um and from there where would you go well, San Marie de la Mar is really the entrance to the Rhone Valley and the Rhone River. And if you run up from San Marie de la Mar, you come to Arles, which is the next town up. Big Roman town with a huge, great amphitheater. Um, uh, Rome was very big in this area. You tend to think that, you know, um, the Roman Empire got poorer and poorer as it went north. But if you look at the Rhone Valley, you've got some enormous great Roman remains there. Mm -hmm. uh, and the amphitheater at Arles is well worth visiting. It's almost complete. Um, and then the next town up is Tarascon, Bucaire, they call it, Tarascon, which is where Martha was supposed to have gone. So Mary and Martha, well, Martha went to Tarascon. And... Um, at Tarascon, she defeated, I'm just looking for a picture here. This. So if I do a quick screen share. Okay. So good conversations in the chat room. I like how somebody said, yeah, Kali also wears the skulls of her victims or those she kills. So there's a vibe connecting that to Mary Magdalene as far as the goddess archetype. Any takeaways from you, Vance? Well, I was wondering, um, there's a little uh, about the some of the passages in the scriptures uh, about Mary Magdalene interacting with the apostles and then being jealous of her and so forth. That was an interest of mine. Um, you know, that type of thing, Mary Magdalene as the, uh, well, she was the priestess, um, you know, that Ralph was relating. Oh no, Ralph. He lost <laughs> he Ralph. sold himself. <laughs> Come back. We have to hear the rest just, of the story. I know. I know. <laughs> I'm sure he'll be back. Hopefully he has the link. I'll check the email. Well, while we're doing this, yeah, Chester, thanks for the super chat. Really appreciate it. I'm going to pull up my email just to make sure. Casey Elm is like, where's the link? Unless, of course, he lost his email because the Merovingians decided to uh, decided to cut him off or something. Could be. You know those Merovingians. Yes, nobody can trust Oh no, that's the that's the Inquisition. <laughs> when... <laughs> Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Now Phil Blair had a question uh, on a super chat um, that we'll have to wait for Ralph to get back for at the appropriate time. Yeah, we'll definitely get to the chats before it's all over. Hopefully, it's not all over and Ralph didn't lose his internet. Ralph, I come back. I had they, I, I had the um yesterday. I had um. They had to work on the internet, so my internet was on and off all day long. Even at the, I was, I was sweating bullets with the interviews and the show. Oh today. yeah, so, yeah. They rarely do these sort of. Um, Here he comes. Uh, right, oh. you got Ralph. You're back. Again. You canceled yourself, <laughs> Ralph. Yeah, my video dropped offline again for some reason. So, um, not sure what was happening there. But what I was trying to do is share a screen, and for some reason we dropped offline. Um, 
Oh, I see. I, yeah, but here, here we yeah, go. Here we now. go. Now we've got you. So um, this is the Tarask, um, which was the fearsome monster that uh, Martha of Bethany tamed when she went to Tarascon. Mm. Uh, it's known as the Tarask. And, um, well, that's what it's supposed to look like. It's supposed to look a bit like a, a tortoise and a cross between a tortoise and a fish, and it's got a lion's head and so on. Um, what I think they're trying to describe here at Tarascon is um, one of these. Uh, that makes sense. Which is a glyptagon. But I'm not sure how they would know what a glyptagon looks like because it's supposed to be in America only. It's supposed to be in... <laughs> Mostly in South America, like an armadillo. Um, but, but anyway, that's what uh, she was supposed to have tamed, and um, from there, the next town up, really, that we come to, is I'm just searching for a an image. Is this place, which is orange? So I, for, for many reasons, because a lot of people say that, you know, Mary went to San Maxime um, over on to, towards the east of the Rhone Valley and the um, uh, Aix-en-Provence and places like that. And that's where, if, if you go there, that's where all the relics will be. You know, the tomb of Mary is supposed to be at um, San Maxime. Uh, but that's just... Um, it's a standard sarcophagus. We, we might have a look at some of these sarcophagi that you find from this era. But I think they actually went up the Rhone Valley because, I mean, the Rhone Valley was like the motorway of this era. Uh, they had these enormous great barges running up, up and down the Rhone Valley with all of the produce on them. You know, this was the motorway or the railway uh, of the first century. And uh, I think they went to this place, which is called Orange. And this is a classical romantic image of the Gate of Orange. This is what it looks like today. So it's still there. I mean, this is first century, uh -huh. although this gate might be slightly later than the first century. Um, so it might be second century. And... Um, they've got this place in here, which is the uh, theater which was, uh, was said to be the finest wall in the whole of the Roman Empire. And you can see this facade is one brick wall that they made for the amphitheater. And while I was there, of course, they were, this is the inside the amphitheater. They, ha they had a play on about Mary Magdalene, of course. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and here she is, the lady with the alabaster jar. Although she should be dressed in gold. They didn't get the color of her yeah. uniform right. Green and gold is what she's supposed to be wearing. Mm -hmm. And this is myself overlooking orange. So sitting on the hill at the top of orange. And uh, this is the statue of Mary on the top of the hill. Um, for many reasons, I think that they actually ended up at orange because orange has a... Um, strange history. It was an independent principality, a little bit like Edessa was an independent principality within the Roman Empire and the um, uh, Persian Empire, the Parthian mm. Empire. And uh, it was run by this guy who's William of Orange. And you can see he's wearing orange, the colors <laughs> of Mary Magdalene, of course. Uh, I mean, this is important because <clears throat> there is symbology to this, this color because the matriarch of this family was called Orania, meaning the heavens. The Greek for the heavens is Orania. But of course, or means gold in both Latin and French. Right. Or means gold. And what they're talking about, I think, when they're looking at this golden color is the sun in the heavens above. So Orania is the heavens, but the sun in the heavens above is golden or orange. And that's why they have this um, standard coloration for Mary Magdalene and for this guy who's William of Orange. Uh, now, the original name in the French was, in the Yucatan, was um, Guilam. Guilam 
uh, de Galone, Guillam de Cortnez, meaning the hooked nose, or the, uh, yeah, the hooked nose, or Guillam de Cortnez. Again, it's a play on words. I, I don't think they wanted to call him Cortnez, meaning the hooked nose, because they didn't want people to know that these, this family was Jewish. Um, and yes, this this princely family were Jewish. We have that from Wolfram von Eschenbach of Arthurian legend fame. Um, Wolfram von Eschenbach writes the history of King Arthur, mm -hmm. but he also writes the history of Orange in the south of France. And that's where we get this history. A lot of this history comes from Wolfram von Eschenbach. And he says that um, this name, his name was Court, Courtenez, meaning the um, hooked nose. And that's why on their coat of arms, they have a cornet, because that's <laughs> it's a play on yeah. words, really, with Courtenez. Right. Uh, so they have a cornet. But the flag of orange was the one gold star. Mm. And of course, the flag Ties of the into, EU and of, of Mary Magdalene is the 12 gold stars. Mm. So a bit like Texas, I suppose, the Lone Star. <laughs> so it's, it's just one disciple, not all of the disciples, not the 12, just the one. So their flag was the gold star on a blue ah, background. That explains the armadillo. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Little French Texas, they found. Right. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so we have this big connection with uh, orange. And I go through in the book lo lots of these connections. And um, the emblem of orange is the three oranges, because that's, well, that's the name of the town, isn't it? Um, <laughs> three oranges are the, are the emblem of the town on the coat of arms. Um, but because the orange is a sun symbol, it is the ore, it is the golden ball, it's the ball in the heavens above, it's an orange. It's an obvious symbol for any sort of solar vener venerating religion is the sun or, or the orange. But um, we, we find um, this coat of arms runs all over the place. It runs to the Courtenay family in France. And there just has to be a link here between Courtenay's and Courtenay, the um, uh, aristocratic family of Courtenay in France, because they have the same coat of arms. Mm -hmm. Now they call this the um, in in heraldry. They call this the three red tarts, um, not of the streetwalker variety, but of the pie <laughs> variety. Um, but why would you have a pie <laughs> as being your emblem? I don't think it's a pie. I think it's the sun symbol again. Um, and this is the Courtenay family in France, but we also get them in Britain as well because remember. Britain at this early age was taken over by um, uh, William the Conqueror, William the First. Okay. And so we got a lot of Norman French coming into Britain. And so the um, royal family, royal family, the aristocratic family of Courtenay in Devon, the Lords of Devon, have this same uh, symbology, the three red tarts. And of course, if we go down to Odessa, I've been saying that these people came from Odessa. The coat of arms of Odessa is the three red tarts. Oh, very interesting. <laughs> hmm. All to do with the Crusades, we think, that the, they took this symbology with them on the first crusade. Um, because yes, here's a, a little oddity for you. The first crusade did not go to Jerusalem. It went to Odessa. Why would they want to go to Odessa? Well, hmm. because they knew this was important. Um, and so, yeah, the, the coat of arms of Odessa is the same as the coat of arms of Orange in France. There oh, we go. Yeah. Uh, wheels within wheels. And so the Courtenay family um, are the same as the princes of Orange. So this is the lord of Courtenay in Britain 
And this is the Prince of Orange in Holland. And you might say, well, what on earth has Holland got to do with this story? <laughs> We're talking about Provence in the <laughs> south of France. Right. Um, well, as, as I was saying, and this is this is his pile. This is in um, the mansion in uh, Devon. But anyway, these two people, I think, look remarkably similar. And I think they are linked because the the city of Orange, as I said, was an independent principality. It was run by initially by this guy, William of Orange, Guillaume de Galone, Guillaume de Orange, um, in the 8th century. So we're going back a long way here. Uh, this is 8th century. And this was the guy who chased the Muslims out of France. So we have the famous battle with Charles Martel, uh, who chased the uh, Muslims out of France at the uh, Battle of... Um, Oh, remind me. I can't remember the battle for a minute. Anyway, um, so there was a famous uh, battle. Oh, Tours, of course, the Battle of Tours. And uh, so the Muslims retreated back into uh, Spain, but then they came back into France. And on the second occasion, they were chased out by this guy, William of Orange. Um, and... He initially had a battle himself with his own army, which was an army of Jewish soldiers, according to Wolfram von Eschenbach. Um, but they were sort of uh, mostly defeated. And so he had to go to the king of, as it were, France, uh, because France was fractured. It wasn't under sort of one king as such, um, who was Louis the I, if I remember correctly who was married to this guy's sister. Mm -hmm. So as usual, the royal family depends upon their counts and their arist uh, aristocrats to actually back them up. And uh, his sister was married to the King of France and he persuaded them uh, <laughs> by threatening to kill his, um, to cut his uh, sister's throat if if the king didn't uh, agree, no to get the king of France to send a, an army down to uh, Orange to uh, chase the Muslims back out of France, which they did. And uh, so Orange remained a an independent principality all the way through, all the way through the um, the Thirty Years' War and so on, the uh, you know the Protestant Reformation which right. caused havoc within Europe. Um, Germany, uh, I've seen some quotations for Germany that they lost 50% of their population. That much? I thought, 30, it, yeah, thought it was huge. like 25. Wow. Yeah. A terrible war. Um, this was the battle between the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church. And of course, it affected Orange because Orange was Protestant, whereas most of France was Catholic. Mm. And Orange had a load of Huguenots in it. And of course, there were these pogroms against the Huguenots, uh, a lot of whom moved down to Orange because it was an independent principality. Right. Um, and so this, this battle affected Orange quite uh, a lot. And then Orange was sort of saved uh, because, uh, what have I not said so far? A lot of these, um, the princes of Orange owned eventually the Netherlands, Holland. Mm -hmm. So they became the princes of Holland, which is why the princes of Holland are known as the princes of Orange. The king, as it were, of Holland is the Prince of Orange, who is mm -hmm. called William, of course, William of Orange, the same as this guy. So um, Orange, the town, was saved when William of Orange in Holland became the king of England. And he was William III of England. Um, and that temporarily gave them the power to save this independent principality in the south of France called Orange. But then William III died rather prematurely, unfortunately. And then Louis XIV, King of France, was then free to invade Orange, the Principality of Orange, and kick them all out of France. And that is what happened. And so Orange came to an end 
during the um, reign of uh, Louis the Fourteenth, and they were all kicked out and exiled, and obviously exiled up to Holland because that was the other uh, estate that they owned at that time. Uh, and on the back of that, of course, Holland became quite rich and wealthy as a trading nation. Um, and their princes of Orange are still there in, in Holland. Um, so that is the history of... I was just going to um, stop share. That is the history of Orange. And I think... There is a strand of history that runs through in Orange. Of course, this is all mythology. This is all based on very flimsy historical evidence because we don't have the um, real evidence. No, there was no Josephus Flavius of this <laughs> region that was writing it all down. Well, not that we know no. of anyway. And so we have very little information to go on apart from people like Wolfram von Eschenbach who wrote the Song of Orange, the Chanson of, of Orange, which tells us a lot of this story. But a lot of people regard this as being mythology in the same way that they regard the history of Arthur, which he also wrote, uh, as being mythology. Um, so unfortunately, we don't have a true history, but we have a history of this independent principality, the same as Edessa was independent, with a different religion, to standard Judaism, um, a different religion, obviously, to Catholic Christianity that was always independent, that was always Protestant. Um, and that history runs all the way through into modern Holland and the princes of Orange in Holland, who, again, are Protestant and independent and um, made a quite a a wealthy and successful nation over in, in Holland. Um, so, yeah, that's the, and that might well be the history and the legacy of the Magdalene in France. That orange was set up by this, this family. And you see, I think you've written that Mary Magdalene in a way is like a symbol, like Hypatia, freedom and free thinking and all that. I mean, because you talk about, the uh, Industrial Revolution was this idea of thought, innovation, not being under the church's heel and all that. Yes. Well, we, we have indications of this from, uh, from the Edessans, from the gospel history, of course. We have their veneration of the Zodiac. Uh, we have the information that they knew that the earth was spherical. Um, I mean, that earth that Helios is holding in that image uh, has latitudes of li uh, latitude, lines of latitude and longitude that are curved, indicating that they knew the earth was a sphere held in the gravitational grasp of Helios, the sun. Um, so they had a great deal of knowledge and technology. They were using the technology of Heron of Alexandria. We know that. Um, so they were into technology and science and mathematics. And so their rule over Rome, if they had managed to get to Rome, because I say that they were looking uh, to take over Rome, we can go into that later, would have been quite different to the Rome that actually uh, we actually had. And certainly very different to the Catholic Church rule of Rome. Because the Roman emperors just became the um, the Roman popes, um, but they were very anti-science, as we know. Whereas this family was very pro-science, and so science might have progressed much faster under their rule. So it would have been quite different, um, and and we get hints of that from the Principality of Orange and so on. So yeah, history turns on a dime sometimes you know sometimes history changes and you go off in a different direction and with the catholic church in charge of course we went off on a different direction that i think probably held us back for a thousand years mm -hmm. um, that's just my guesstimate yeah, indeed no it's uh yeah great journey 
Uh, Vince, do you want to take care of questions in a couple of super chats? I have to let, I, I'm hearing a cat. The cats have been behaving, but I think they need out. So <laughs> sure. Right yeah. Um, you know, we have a couple of questions from the audience. Philip Blair wanted to know, uh, did Nazarene relate to current Ethiopian Judaism and the Nazarene Judaism? Um, I don't think so. Um, the, the Judaism of that region probably came around from uh, the date of Solomon and his, um, no, actually probably before that, Moses um, and Aaron. Um, according to Manetho, Moses was the army commander of the Egyptian army. And he fought a battle down in that region with the Nubians and defeated the Nubian army and married the Nubian queen who was called Tharbis. So even back in that era, we're talking 1300s uh, BC, um, we have these people because they're connected with Judaism down in Nubia, fighting against the Nubians and getting involved with the um, Nubian royalty. So people who eventually became the Israelites were involved in that region way back in 13th, uh, 14th century BC, a long time ago. So they might have a long history, or they might come from the uh, people who were exiled from uh, Jerusalem during the Babylonian exile. Uh, during the Babylonian exile, uh, the Babylonians came and they defeated uh, Judea and Jerusalem and they took away uh, a lot of the population into uh, slavery uh, in Babylon. But another party of them escaped south and they went to Egypt. And I think they went to Saba, which is Yemen. And Yemen is just across the road from Ethiopia. So they might have ended up in Ethiopia and had this contact between Saba and Ethiopia at that time, which is the um, uh, the time just um, yeah just about uh, at the B Babylonian exile date, which is about roughly 600 BC. So they might might well date from that sort of era. Okay, very good. Um, Francis of Sophia Klatt wanted to know if uh, Mary Magdalene and uh, is Mary Magdalene and her association with the Holy Grail just a medieval romance or is there, if there, is there something to it? No, it's not just a romance. This is, uh, we, we have um, we have mentions of the Holy Grail, which would include someone like Mary Magdalene. So um, from, we get a lot of this from Arthurian legend. This is why Arthurian legend is important sometimes, even though it's semi-mythological. Um, we have the Holy Grail, which has several facets or aspects of it. You know, on the initial aspect, it's a dish that held the blood of Christ. So yeah. it's the um, Sangreal, it's the holy dish. But it's also the Sangreal, it is the royal blood. And we have this, which involves a princess. And we have this from Arthurian legend where uh, Firefitz is a knight from the east, from Babylon, who's now joining the Knights of the Round Table. And the Holy Grail is paraded at the, um, the uh, Grail table, the Round Table of the Knights. And uh, so the other knights say to Firefitz, um, can you see the grail? And he says, no, he's looking around for this dish. He can't see anything. He says, no, I, I can't see anything apart from this princess in front of me holding a green cloth. And of course, all of the other knights fall about laughing because the grail is the princess. Ah. She is the bloodline. It's her womb. Um, so that is the second manifestation of, of the grail. And so, of course, this goes on through the dynasties, of course, through the generations. And so if Mary Magdalene was of this royal family, then, of course, she would be the grail princess and the holder of the grail um, as this grail goes down the generations. Um, 
the third aspect of this grail, again from Arthurian legend, is that the grail is a stone. Not just any old stone, it's a sacred meteorite. And we can go through this history at a later time because it's, it's quite long and convoluted. But this is the Ben Ben stone from Egypt. It used to be in Heliopolis. And it's a conical stone, was supposed to be a meteorite. Was supposed to have come down from the heavens in a fiery ball. So it was a piece of the sun that had broken off and fallen to earth. It was the phoenix, basically, the fiery bird that came through the sky. Uh, this was the Ben Ben stone, but it was taken from Egypt uh, by the Greeks and ended up in um, uh, Delphi, the Omphala stone of Delphi. So we have images of it there, where again, it's a conical stone covered in netting for some reason. And then it went on a tour of um, uh, Persia, Parthia, because Alexander went and conquered all of Persia. Um, and we have images on the coins there from, um, from Parthia. And again, it's a conical stone covered in netting. Then it came back and it went to Edessa. Then it went a little bit further south and it went to Emesa, which is pretty much where Damascus is. And again, we have images of it in a temple. Um, I wonder if I can just pick up some imagery here since uh, we're looking at this. Sure. Um, so if I open... Yeah, don't cancel yourself again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I don't know why it did that. Yeah. Yeah. Um... So we want Elagabal. And if I open these. Bump, so they opened. So if I go to uh, share screen and share, share a window. So there you go. they should come up. We are there. Ah. Good. So this is the Ben Ben stone is what we can see initially. And you can see the phoenix standing on the Ben Ben stone. This is from ancient e Egyptian uh, creation epic. Um, and this is uh, the stone at Delphi. This is in Greece. Mm. And you can see it's a small conical stone again. Um, this is the stone from Syria. Uh, sorry, Syria, from Persia when it was in Parthia. And you can see Apollo sitting on the stone and it's covered in netting again. Um, and so it was, a, it was a throne of the gods. This is how important it was. It was the throne of Apollo. Um, this is the stone when it was in, and we can go into this in more detail later, when it was in Edessa, it was in a box. So here is the stone inside of the Ark of the Covenant. This is the Ark of the Covenant. Mm. which was supposed to be at Edessa. This is in the first and the second century AD. Um, and the stone is inside the box, just like in the Old Testament that the Ark of the Covenant contained a sacred stone. Same idea here. Um, <clears throat> this is the stone when it was in Syria, in Emesa, which is near Damascus. It's Homs and Hammer near Damascus. And again, it's a conical stone. And you can see on it the phoenix. The body of the phoenix is in the center. And then two wings either side, head yeah. at the top. So it's got it's embossed with the um, image of the phoenix again. And this is the um, Elagabal when it went to Rome. It was taken to Rome by Emperor Elagabalus. This is Emperor Elagabalus, who was a Syrian emperor from uh, Homs and Hammer from Damascus. Um, and let's have a, a closer in look. There it is. And here you can see it in a chariot, conical stone, embossed mm. with the yeah. uh, image of the phoenix, um, being taken around Rome by Emperor Elagabalus, who was the mad um, emperor who was castrated himself so he could become a eunuch. And we can go into... <laughs> He um, followed Cybele or something? Yeah, yeah, okay. absolutely. You you know yeah. the story. Um, yeah. That's the end of that bloodline. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, you could do this later in life, so you could have children ah, first. I see. Um, but this, I mean, this is why Jesus asked for his um, disciples to castrate themselves. Right. Yeah. 
And again, you won't get this from the pulpit because they don't like to admit it too much. But this comes from Matthew 19, 12. And uh, Jesus says, there are some eunuchs that were born from their mother's womb. And there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs by men. Uh, but there are some eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. It's a direct invitation for the disciples to castrate themselves if they wanted to become the priest of the Holy Stone, the Elagabal Stone. Which That's origin, why the primary disciple of, of Jesus was called Peter, the stone. Mm, that makes sense. His, his name wasn't Peter, of course. His name was Simon, but he was called Peter Kephas. He was the keeper of the stone. Mm. And so Peter would have been castrated. It would have been Peter who castrated himself. This is why they had that uh, meeting on the Mount of Olives where that young lad escaped naked. Yeah. That's what they were doing. They, they were having a castration ceremony. And that was probably Peter that ran off. Who knows? I don't know. In the Gospel of Mark. No, that's <laughs> that's interesting, too. And in, in the Nessene literature, Ralph, the Nessenes just say that Jesus and Addis are the same God. They don't even, they yeah, don't even but, waste their time. <laughs> yeah, same idea. For, for people who don't know, Attis was the castrated um, partner of Cybele, or Cybele, right, as right. I should say. And so, yes, he is the prototype upon which the priests of this stone were based. They were imitating Attis. Mm -hmm. um, and they were the keepers of the, the holy stone, the sacred stone. Now, the stone goes missing because uh, Emperor Elagabalus, who's named after this stone, of course, um, was not best liked. He was um, an Eastern king with Eastern funny, strange dress and strange habits and castrated, which we're not allowed to do <laughs> in Rome. It was forbidden. Um, and then he sort of, he, he ran wild with the um, Vestal Virgins, which he wasn't supposed to do either. No. Um, and then he had, um, well, I suppose a bit like Nero as well. He, he married a man as well um, who, who pretended to be a woman. It's all a, it's, it's, it's a bit like recent events in America, really, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully he didn't appear on a beer can somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yes, I'm sure he'd be there. Ella Gabalas would be there straight away, you know, <laughs> on, on a can of uh, Bud Light. <laughs> um, but anyway, so he was killed after about five years, four years, five years, and the stone goes missing. So the holy, this stone is the Holy Grail. This is the, the stone they are looking for. It's a sacred stone, supposed to be meteoric, supposed to be metallic, supposed to be magnetic. And of course, if it was highly magnetic, it would have strange properties, which were difficult to explain in that era. So if you uh, approached this stone with a sword, then the hand of God would come out from nowhere and pull the sword out of your hand and stick mm -hmm. it onto the stone. This is the sword in the stone uh, exercise from uh, Arthurian legend. And of course, that would be very difficult to explain I was wondering in that about era. That. How does this invisible force grab your sword and stick it onto this stone? Mm. It would be, that would certainly make this stone appear very special. Um, so it goes missing, this stone. We don't know where it has. The Scots keep saying they've got it up at Scone or Scone. The stone of Scone in Scotland is supposed to be this stone, but of course we have no evidence of that. Um, but there is a tradition of this stone going around and people still sort of venerate it or do something with it because I was sitting in a cinema watching a James Bond film as one does from time to time and uh, sort of minding my own business, brain in neutral. And they have this scene where the um, James Bond is taken into the baddies lair and his lair is in this big uh, meteorite crater. And he has this uh, planetarium in the meteorite crater. Um, and he takes him into this planetarium and there is the Elagabal stone there. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Hidden in plain sight. 
<laughs> so yeah, hidden in plain sight yet again. So I'm sitting there in the cinema, and I'm 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 the guy that falls off his chair, and everyone's looking at me <laughs> going, <"What?" laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, how on earth did that? Because it takes no place in this particular film. I think it was um, Starfall or something fall. Mm -hmm. um, was was the Bond film, and it this stone has nothing to do with the film whatsoever. And then the baddie comes out and says how special this stone is, how it's the oldest rock in the entire universe, uh, and how this stone is so lonely, and things of this nature. I'll have wow. to try and get that clip again and actually watch it to see what he said. Uh, but it is quite obviously the Elagabal stone. Mm -hmm. And what it's doing in a Bond film and who thought of putting it there, I really don't know. <laughs> How about the stone in the Kaaba? You don't think uh, that it wound up there, do you? Because that's that was supposed to be yes, part of the same stone. But of course, if you've seen the Kaaba stone, it's only a few little pieces. Um, it's not the actual um, stone itself. So it's just it's six small pieces supposed to be from this stone. Oh. Um, but we don't oh. know if it is. But that's the that's the rumors about the Kaaba. Very interesting. interesting. And uh, what book uh, do you do with the Holy Grail and the stone? Because you have a lot of uh, this, people are curious. It 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 sort of appears in several books, um, but mostly in the King Jesus book and Jesus King of Edessa, and then the Grail Cipher, which is my Arthurian book, um, where I write quite a lot about this stone, because it appears within Arthurian legend as the Holy Grail. Yeah, this yes, is, uh, Jesus Ralph's King of book. His opus, if you would, it's a big book, yeah. but six hundred page opus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to give Robert Eisenman a run for his money, are you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh well, if Eisenman can do it, I'm sure I can. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Well, it's been great. Well, we're heading towards the finale. Anything else you want to add? Uh, or we can do it for our sequel, Ralph. Up to you. Yeah. Well, we've got lots of talk to talk about. But I think, as you say, we're, we're running out of time. So we'll probably have to leave it for a sequel. Um, we've got all of um, our theory. In, well, we've got the whole of Odessa to talk about. I mean, that's mm. two hours at least, just talking about why I think this Jesus character uh, was a prince of Odessa. Um, and then we've got the whole of Arthurian legend to talk about, which is another couple of hours, because I turn Arthurian legend on its head a little bit. Um, because we have the same Arthur. problem with Arthurian legend. This guy is missing from the historical record. You know, it's the same old, same old. Yeah, yeah, this is a... Yeah, definitely. Well, let's do it. Well, for the audience, uh, uh, last uh, question or remark, fans, or any anybody else? Well, yeah, next any time questions I, from the floor. Yeah, um, next time I want to hear about um, Mary uh, and her um, interactions with the apostles and how that came to be in, in the Bible and so forth. Yeah, like the yeah well, Gospels. very quickly we can run right. through that because sure. that's not too long. We have um, a number of references from the um, Nag Hammadi. Um, I'm just trying to find what it actually says. There was that one where um, they were complaining that she was a woman, the apostles, you know, to Jesus, and he was yeah. talking about making her a man or something, a male. The Gospel of Thomas, the yeah, and then yeah. in the Gospel of Mary, they get in a fight. Also, pissed us. Yeah, it's always Peter and kind of. Uh... Yeah, she's. He was always at odds with her. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah, I can't find the um, reference. I was going to um, quote it. I'll have to do that for later. But yes, I had a reference um, from, perhaps I've got it here. Yes, I've got it here. So um, it says, Jesus loved Mary Magdalene more than all of the other disciples and used to kiss her often on the, on the something. Um, the rest of the disciples said to Jesus, why do you love her more than all of us? Um, and the Savior the answered, Philip. Yeah. why, yes, why do I not love, he, he's questioning them, why do I not love uh, you like I love her? As if, you know, you, you've got to be mad. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's pretty obvious um, that they were a couple. I mean, we've seen that from the 
um, the zodiac at um, Bet Xian, where we have the Jesus and Mary character together in the middle of the zodiac. It's quite obvious that they were a couple, that they were the um, uh, that they were the king and the queen together. Actually, I've got just very quickly because this won't take too long. Sure, I've got some imagery here which shows again you were talking here miguel about keeping things in plain sight um how easy it is to do this and this comes from snow white so if i do a quick share with the milky way here we go that should be coming up that's up um <clears throat> so we all know the fairy tale of Snow White, but we probably don't know what it's meaning. Um, but Snow White is a story of the cosmos. So Snow White is the Snow White moon. And the wicked uh, witch is actually the Milky Way. Mm. And who is the Milky Way? Well, here's an image of the Milky Way uh, spreading herself across the skies. And she is obviously... Newt, this is the Egyptian oh, Newt, yeah. who spreads her body across the uh, skies in the heavens oh, wow. above. So Geb and Newt are the earth. Here's Geb down the bottom. And this is Newt spreading herself across the skies. And if you look at the Milky Way, she even has arms and legs on both ends. The Milky Way splits up. And this is what they were talking about when they were describing Newt within Egyptian uh, theology. But Newt is, is the wicked witch. and Snow White is the Snow White Moon. And of course, the Snow White Moon has the seven dwarf planets following her across the uh, ecliptic. So the moon is followed by the seven planets across the ecliptic. They are the seven dwarfs. But the Wicked Witch doesn't like Snow White, so he gives her a corset. And he pulls the cor she pulls the corset tighter and tighter to make her get thinner and thinner and thinner, which is exactly what happens to the moon as the moon approaches the sun. It gets thinner and thinner. It's the um, uh, waning, isn't it? The waning moon. Yes. Until she dies. So Snow White dies. She is the new moon. The new moon is dead. You can't see it. It's black. It's right. dead. And then the new moon, and this only happens at the new moon, the new moon kisses the sun prince. So this is the, the solar prince and snow white moon kisses the snow, the, um, the solar prince in an eclipse, which can only happen when the moon is dead. And then you get the, what do they call this? The diamond ring, the mm -hmm. diamond ring of an eclipse. And of course the, the moon is exactly the same diameter as the sun which must have been obvious to the ancients that that was a creation by the gods because, you know, what's the chances of these two uh, solar bodies being exactly the same size? Yeah. And then after this, this is called a syzygy, where you have this cosmic marriage in the heavens above, um, in flagrante delecto, I suppose you could call it. It's a consummation of their marriage. And then after the, the sun prince kisses the moon, she comes back to life and she gets fatter and fatter as if she's pregnant. It is a um, story of the, um, of the cosmos. So, and very few people will know that. So again, you can hold these secrets in plain sight. You don't need to keep them. Well, I suppose you need to keep the knowledge within a secret society, but the actual information can be out there. Yeah. And all you need is when you, join a secret society someone just needs to whisper uh snow white's the moon yeah ah yeah oh i get it now <laughs> and also it helps if you keep the population dumb and ignorant to it yeah done great job that. great job in this 20 21st century. yeah they've been doing that very well especially yeah. in britain <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if you know in britain we had this wonderful policy our labor party which is the equivalent of your democrats i suppose um, said that um, we want equality or equity, call it nowadays, within education. 
we, we don't want brilliant people, we want equality. So they went around the whole of the country, identifying all of the best schools in the whole of the land and closing them down. What? These were known the as the grammar school. schools. Right. And they had this policy, it's a real policy, and they closed down all of the grammar schools because no. they were too good. Now, that was a policy to dumb down the um, yeah, population. That's what it is. And then it they is. said, social mobility is getting worse. Well, what do you think? <laughs> you closed <laughs> down all the best schools, which were taking people from the gutters, literally, you know, from miners, from street cleaners. If you were good enough and got into one of these elite schools, the grammar schools, you would go on to Oxford and Cambridge. Mm -hmm. That was the whole idea of these schools. They closed them down and then they wondered why social mobility went down. Well, yeah, because we have no way of taking these poor people and putting them into the best universities. Yeah, so you're right. They've they've had this policy of dumbing down the whole of the population. Same as it ever That's was. That's my little soapbox. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a good one. It's a good I one. was a child of the grammar school, you see. I came through the grammar school system. Yeah, yeah. I bene benefited from this. Um, and, and the weird thing is, all of these politicians within the Labour Party who were pushing for this, they were children of the grammar school as well. Oh. So they had benefited from this system and then they condemned it and pulled up the ladder behind them so no one else could climb up the same ladder. <laughs> oh, terrible. Terrible. Oh, well, this is the world we live in, so all we can do is spread the truth. So, Well, awesome. Well, we are at the end uh, of this uh, particular journey. I, we, I believe we've done Mary Magdalene a lot of justice. So check out Ralph's book. Uh, this will be on audio in a day or two. The replay was here, Rockfin, other places. So check it out. Please support this podcast, even if you can just like and share the hell out of it. Uh, share it to your Catholic and fundamentalist friends. Uh, let's get the truth out there. Really appreciate it. So for the audience, thank you for being here. Great comments. Uh, your support is great. Uh, and uh, Vance, thanks for keeping us company too. Oh, it was a lot of fun. And uh totally fascinating this is i love this stuff this is my bailiwick i love it it's awesome well ralph uh great to have you on and uh let's have you on in the near future sooner rather than later and let's get into odessa and king arthur yeah more, more. sounds like a great idea thanks for having me on it's been a grand show thank you oh before we go where for those on audio where can where do people need to go to find out more about you your work your books oh et yes we can't forget about that can we yeah, so, i know we um, gotta promo you <laughs> <laughs> my website is edfu-books.com e-d-f-u edfu-books um my webs as my facebook site is ralph.ellis.144 that's my uh, Facebook site, which is quite active. I'm always posting on there. The books are all available from Amazon. And um, try and get the 2017 or later editions. They are the latest editions. There are some old editions running around on Amazon. Um, and my YouTube site, I've just done a few videos on YouTube. Um, YouTube Ralph Ellis, I suppose. And it's the one with a sort of uh, a red and gold phoenix on, on the thumbnail. And those are my um, videos. So yeah, there's lots of information out there. Um, do read the books there. There's now, I think, 14 in the series. Whoa. <laughs> there's quite a lot to go on. Awesome. Well, you heard it and I'll have it on the show notes, but we are at the end of this quest. So Everybody have a good weekend, a good rest of your Friday. And as I say, write your own gospel, live your own myth. Until the next time, take care, everybody.